Now, let us discuss the modern interpretation of the phenomenon of electricity based on atomic physics. This interpretation provides us deeper knowledge on the relation between electric charge and matter. In modern physics, electric charge is a basic property of the atoms, molecules and elementary particles such as electrons, protons and neutrons. The atoms and molecules are electrically neutral due to their structural properties. The ionization of atoms and molecules modifies their electron shells and transforms them into ions, which are charged particles. What are the properties of electric charge in such a model? Electric charge, like mass and energy is quantized. Any macroscopic charge Q is given by an integer multiple of the electric charge carried by a single electron called the elementary charge E. We can write the charge Q as plus minus N times E, where N is an arbitrary integer number and the signs plus and minus indicate whether the charge is positive or negative. Since the elementary charge E is tiny, every macroscopic charge Q consists of an extremely large number of elementary charges. This important fact allows us to regard the macroscopic charge as a continuous quantity. We saw that the electron has a negative elementary charge, which we can denote with minus E, the proton has a positive elementary charge, denoted by plus E, and the neutron has no electric charge, that is the neutron electrically neutral. Therefore, electrons and protons carry opposite charges with the same magnitude. We also call the charged particles charge carriers. As a result, electrons repel each other with their like charges, so do protons. However, electrons and protons attract each other with their opposite charges. Since the particles in atoms carry charges, the question is how electric charge is distributed in atoms. In the atom model of matter, the atoms are the building blocks of matter which determine the structural properties of the elements. The atoms have two parts, the nucleus and the electron cloud or shells. The nucleus of an atom consists of the same number of protons and neutrons, although their numbers differ in isotopes. The average radius of a nucleon is measured from about 1 to 7 times 10 to minus 15 meters. The electron cloud is located around the nucleus and its diameter is about 1 to 3 times 10 to minus 10 meters. Since the number of protons and electrons is the same in an atom, it has the same amount of positive and negative charges. As a result, atoms are electrically neutral. There is an electrostatic attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron shell. There is also a repulsion between the electrons in the shell. Such repulsion exists between protons in the tightly packed nucleus as well, but the attraction due to nuclear forces is much more stronger which keeps these particles together. Due to ionization, atoms loosing or capturing electrons become positively or negatively charged ions. Electrons, charged ions or other charged particles are called charge carriers. In solids the situation is more complicated since the nuclei of the atoms have fixed locations, whereas the electrons can move in these materials. In the case of metals the valence electrons can freely propagate between the atoms. When the valence electrons leave their atoms the atoms become charged ions. In insulators and dielectric materials the electrons have a very limited motion. Since the displacements of the valence electrons is limited, their atoms can only be polarized and become electric dipoles. If we use the model based on atom physics, then we can provide a corpuscular interpretation of the static electricity in matter. According to this model, during the friction of two electrically neutral bodies made from different materials, the charge carriers migrate from one material into the other one. In this example, the charge carriers are electrons and they migrate from the wool into the ebonite. After the separation of charge, the body capturing electrons becomes positively charged whereas the body loosing them becomes positively charged. Therefore, the wool and the ebonite rod attain positive and negative charges respectively. We note that the number of electrons captured by the ebonite rod is equal to the number of electrons migrated from the wool. In the experiment with the metal cylinders, we brought a negatively charged ebonite rod near the cylinder A. Then the corpuscular explanation of the separation of charge is the following. The negatively charged ebonite rod repels the free electrons in the cylinder A, which results in a shortage of electrons in it. At the same time there is an excess of electrons in the cylinder B, since it is in contact with the cylinder A. As a result, the cylinders A and B attain positive and negative charges respectively. If we separate the two cylinders, then the positive charge remains in the cylinder A and the negative one remains in the cylinder B. That is, we have induced charges in the cylinders. If we bring the cylinders into contact again then they become electrically neutral, which shows that the two cylinders have the same amount of the induced charges. The corpuscular interpretation also helps us to understand the transfer of charge from bodies to the ground. 
If we bring a negatively charged ebonite rod near a grounded metal cylinder, the negative charge on the road repels the free electrons in the cylinder. These repelled free electrons will flow into the ground through the metal wire connecting it with the cylinder. As a result, there will be a shortage of electrons in the metal cylinder which becomes positively charged. If we remove the ebonite rod and disconnect the cylinder from the ground, the positive charge on the cylinder can be measured by an electroscope. If a positively charged glass rod is brought near the grounded metal cylinder, then the positive charge on the rod will attract the free electrons in the cylinder. Free electrons also flows into the cylinder from the ground though the metal wire. As a result, there will be an excess of electrons in the metal cylinder which becomes negatively charged. If we remove the glass rod and disconnect the cylinder from the ground, then the negative charge on the cylinder can be measured by an electroscope. We can also ask what happens to the electroscope in these experiments in the light of the corpuscular theory. If an electrically charged body is brought near the charging plate of the electroscope, then both negative and positive charges are induced in the measuring device due to the separation of charge. The charging plate and the gold leaves attain opposite charges. If we use a positively charged glass rod, then the plate becomes negatively charged and the leaves attain positive charge. If we use a negatively charged ebonite rod, then the plate becomes positively charged and the leaves attain negative charge. Since like charges on the two gold leaves repel each other, the leaves will diverge. If we remove the charged body from the vicinity of the charging plate, the gold leaves relax. That is, the instrument has no longer induced charge. If a charged body is brought into contact with the charging plate of the electroscope, then charge carriers are transferred from the body to the instrument and it will attain the same type of charge. In the experiments presented here, we could use an electroscope to determine the type of the charge attained by a body. It is very simple to perform such measurement if we prepare the electroscope, that is, if we use a charged instrument. Let us suppose that the electroscope we use have negative charge. Then its gold leaves diverge, since the like charges on the leaves repel each other. If we bring a negatively charged ebonite rod near the charging plate of the electroscope, the gold leaves of the electroscope will rise more. In generally, if we bring a body with like charge near the plate of the charged electroscope, then the gold leaves of the electroscope will diverge more. We can explain this result based on the corpuscular theory. Due to the induced charges in the electroscope, the amount of the negative charge carriers increases on the leaves. But we also know that the more charge carriers on the gold leaves are, the greater the repelling force between the stripes is. Therefore the leaves rise further. Now we can bring a positively charged glass rod near the plate of the, the negatively charged electroscope, and we find that the gold leaves become more relaxed. In generally, if we bring a body with opposite charge near the plate of the charged electroscope, then the gold leaves of the electroscope will become more relaxed. Due to the induced charges in the electroscope, the amount of the negative charge carriers decreases on the leaves. The fewer the charge carriers on the gold leaves are, the less the repelling force between the stripes is. The experiments presented here also demonstrate the conservation of electric charge. If we rub electrically neutral bodies against each other, then the excess of electrons in any of these bodies is equal to the shortage of the electrons in the other one. That is, the induced charges in both bodies are equal to each other. For example, if we rub an electrically neutral ebonite rod with wool, then free electrons move from the wool into the ebonite rod. If we remove the wool, then the wool attains positive charge and the ebonite rod attains negative one. If we touch the charged ebonite rod with the charged wool then they become electrically neutral again, demonstrating that the wool and the ebonite rod have the same amount of induced charge. This result could also be seen in the experiments, where charged bodies produce the separation of charge in the bodies brought near them. We can remember the experiment with the metal cylinders as well, where we brought a negatively charged ebonite rod near the electrically neutral metal cylinders A and B kept in contact with each other. We could demonstrate the charge separation in the cylinders when we separated them, and remove the charged ebonite rod from the vicinity of the cylinder. The cylinders A and B attained positive and negative charge respectively. When we brought the cylinders into contact with each other, both of them became electrically neutral. Therefore, the excess of electrons in the cylinder B was the same as the shortage of them in the cylinder A. This result shows that the two cylinders have the same amount of induced charge. Other important examples in atom physics are the electron-positron pair creation and annihilation. When an electron with a charge minus E and a positron with a charge plus E collide at low energy, the process results in the annihilation of both the particles and in the creation of two gamma photons. During the destruction of the electron and the positron the charges minus E and plus E disappear, and electrically neutral gamma photons are emitted. 
In other hand, a gamma photon near a nucleus can also disappear while an electron-positron pair is produced. Both examples demonstrate the conservation of charge in the annihilation and creation of charged particles. All these phenomena verify the law of conservation of electric charge, which states that the net charge, that is the algebraic sum of the charges is constant in any electrically isolated system. We also note that electric charge is relativistically invariant, that is, the amount of charge is the same in any frame of reference, no matter if the frame is at rest or in motion. Therefore, the amount of the electric charge remains the same whether its carrier is moving or not, and it does not depend on the velocity of its carrier. Given positive or negative charge carriers at rest will still have the same charge when they are in motion. It is easy to see if the amount of charge depended on the velocity of its carrier, then we could change the amount of the net charge in an electrically isolated system by accelerating a given type of charge in the system.